Giaquit, hello. Welcome to the podcast series of the Center for Irish Studies at Villanova University. My name is Joseph Lennon, Emily C. Riley, Director of the Center. And I'm Jennifer Joyce, Assistant Director and Curator of this series. We appreciate the support from our many donors, especially a generous grant from the Connolly Foundation. Irish Studies at Villanova has existed for 40 years, and in that time, both Ireland and the Irish diaspora have changed enormously. This podcast series will reflect on these changes through the nine different academic disciplines that are taught through Villanova's Center for Irish Studies. Our faculty and students will engage in discussions with distinguished thinkers, artists, writers, academics, political leaders, and other campus visitors. This year, our central question will revolve around the changes the past 40 years have brought. Thank you so much for listening, and if you are in the area, please come to one of our events. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or email us at irishstudies at villanova.edu. Thank, Thank you, you and, and enjoy. enjoy. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Villanova Centre for Irish Studies podcast. This is the fifth in our series celebrating our 40 year anniversary at the centre. My name is Sira Murta and I am Assistant Professor of Irish Politics at Villanova. And we are very lucky to be joined today by writer and journalist Freya McClements. Uh, who's here to talk to us today about the current state of politics and the peace process in Northern Ireland, um, a topic that I know is of great interest to our listeners in the Villanova community. Uh, Freya is an accomplished journalist and writer. Um, she's currently Northern Ireland correspondent with Ireland's leading quality newspaper, The Irish Times. And she's also the author, together with Joe Duffy, of the award-winning book, Children of the Troubles, the untold story of children killed in the Northern Ireland conflict. This book examines the deaths of 186 children killed during the North's conflict. It was published last year and it won the Best Irish Published Book of the Year Prize at the 2019 Irish Book Awards. Freya, it's a pleasure to have you here. Well, virtually. Um, Are you lovely to be here? Uh, thank you so much yeah, for taking the time uh, out of your, you know, your no doubt very busy schedule and your, your reporting to speak to us today from, from Derry. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you. Um, so Freya, it's, um, it's a bit of an understatement to say that it's been an eventful year in Northern Ireland to date. Um, so in January, a government in Belfast was re-established after a, a three-year political crisis. Um, at the end of that month, the UK officially left the European Union. Um, this year, we've also seen same-sex marriage and abortion laws extended to Northern Ireland. Um, and of course, in February, Northern Ireland um, recorded its first confirmed case of COVID-19 and has since been dealing with the outbreak. Um, and I'd like to ask you today about, maybe not all of those developments, but at least uh, some of them. Uh, but before we get into that, um, I just wanted to ask you how you've been managing yourself since the outbreak and in particular how, how life for you as a, as a journalist has transformed since the, um, since the outbreak and since the lockdown conditions. What does a, a normal working day for you look like at the moment? Yeah, well, it, it, it's funny because th that normal working day has really changed because usually as a journalist, you, you're used to being out and about all the time and you're meeting people and you're talking to people and, and you're maybe going to events, or you're going to press conferences or you're, you're going to do interviews and, and, and everything now is done from home. Um, the Irish Times was, I think, the first newspaper in Ireland um, to, to move production um, in, in entirely out of the office and and and, and at home and um, so we've been putting out the paper and that's not just the journalists like me but that's actually you know the page makeup people you know e e the editors everybody who has a role in that it's all being done from from you know in some some cases people's kitchen tables or you know cer certainly kind of all, all done from home and, and it was something that I think we never would have thought was possible kind of five or six weeks ago but it's something that's been really really necessary so I, I suppose um that's one of the ways in which my day has changed. It's also changed just because there's only really one story and that story is coronavirus. So a typical day now is in front of the computer at home, you know, you're interviewing people about coronavirus, you're talking on the phone to people about coronavirus and, and, and you're, you're, you're writing that up. And, um, you know, it, it, it can be, it can be, it can be difficult sometimes thinking about it and, 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 looking at it in, in, in such an in-depth kind of way and I'm, I'm sure you know you've all heard sort of 
warnings, you know, not to listen to too much news. I would never want to encourage people to stop listening to news. But sometimes when you're, 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 you're so caught up in, in the midst of it, um, sometimes it can be difficult. And that there, there are, are moments every so often when, when I think you, you really grasp just the, the gravity of what's going on. And one of those ones, the, the health minister in Northern Ireland um, is, is a man called Robin Swan. And he, at one point, they were talking about modelling predictions um, for what the number of fatalities in, in, in Northern Ireland might be. And at one, at one point, the, the, the worst case scenario that they envisaged was that there could be 15,000 deaths. Now that's uh, more than three times more the number of deaths throughout the, the the entire troubles and 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 um robin swan he, he, he talked about you know we, we just need to pray you know and that was something that really struck me and, and, and the fear of that you know kind of really really struck me but at, at the same time you know i think you know the principles as a journalist i mean i i consider myself really lucky and really privileged that you get to spend your days talking to people and you get to see you know, you get to see the good, the good things, and you get to see the bad things, and you know, you get to be with people at sometimes amazing times in their lives and, and really tough times, and, and and in a sense, that's that's what we're still doing. You know, the news is still there; it's still happening. You know, we we still report it, and I think it's probably, you know, more important than it ever was that we continue to do this at at, at this time. So that's what that's what that's what we're, we're doing, and it's what we will keep doing, and it's what we'll do after this as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it is certainly from the sounds of it not easy. Um, but yeah, we, uh, those of us who are consuming the news and uh, particularly, you know, those of us with an interest in, in Irish politics very much appreciate the, the work that you're, that you're doing and the reporting that you're doing at the moment. Um, yeah. And, and you know, it's worth it's worth saying as well. I know you'll echo this as well. Is that you know, you know, compared to what what sort of people on the front line are doing, and you think of you know the, the nurses and, and and the doctors and all the healthcare staff, and even even you know people like you know that the, the supermarket um, staff are kind of keep ev keep everything going. I mean, what one of the things that that's happened here every Thursday night, people go out and clap kind of on their doorsteps, the healthcare workers, and that that's been ju just lovely. And there's somebody said to me today, you know, this this you know you know in some ways is bringing out the best in people, and that's you know been lovely to see at such a tough time as well absolutely absolutely yeah the same is happening here and it's really it's really lovely people are out with their pots and pans and everything and yeah um yeah no i would i would absolutely echo that um so freya as our as our listeners will be aware um government in northern ireland was recently re-established um after a three-year suspension and a prolonged political crisis and um, and dispute between the the two main power sharing parties or the two power sharing parties, the Nationalist or Republican Sinn Féin um, and the Unionist Democratic Unionist Party or DUP. Um, there were a number of, of facets to that crisis, but power sharing initially obviously broke down over um, the renew a renewable uh, heating scheme scandal in which the DUP in particular was embroiled. Um, it ex uh, expanded or broadened um, out to, to other issues as time went on and of course it all unfolded against the, the backdrop of, of Brexit. Um, but that, that crisis you know, at times appeared quite intractable, obviously went on for, for three years uh, and there were a number of failed attempts, one in particular in 2018. Can you just explain to our listeners, so a deal was done in, in January, um, the new decade, new approach, uh, agreement between the British and Irish governments and most of the, the main parties. Um, can you just explain to the listeners how that deal came to be reached in January and how it was possible in January, you know, when it had eluded the, the parties up to that point? And maybe uh, explain a little bit about what the deal entailed. Sure. Um, I mean, I think the the, the real difference um, was was the will to do a deal, I, I suppose, and and where that came from was that there, there was a there was a snap general election um, called in December in, in twenty nineteen. Um, so which was it was sort of one of the consequences of kind of the the. the UK wide um, sort of sort of implications in terms of of, of Brexit and and the, the Brexit deadline that that one of the many Brexit deadlines there had been I should say um, at, at at the end of October. Um, so there's a UK general election um, called in in December and um, as I'm, I'm sure your listeners are aware, are aware there, there there are sort of several levels of government in Northern Ireland. So in Northern Ireland we send 
uh, MPs to the, the UK Parliament in, in Westminster. And then obviously there's also a, a devolved power sharing government as well, and then sort of, sort of local government. Um, so the, 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 the general election campaign uh, that December was sort of fought against the backdrop of there having been no uh, Stormont government in Northern Ireland, no devolved power sharing government for, for almost three years. And the, the message that certainly that the DUP and Sinn Féin were, were getting on the doorsteps was that people were fed up with this. People wanted, they wanted the return of the, the power sharing government. And, and, and I mean, there, there were other pressures kind of building behind the scenes. I mean, there were huge problems in the health service, for, for example. So this was all in, in, increasing that, that pressure. Um, and there, there were some sort of very significant results then um, in that election. Um, so the, 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 the DUP lost seats, um, the, the alliance gained um, and Sinn Féin, um, the percentage of the vote was down, even though th their net, they lost one seat in foil, but they, they, they regained another one in North Belfast. Um, they took, it was, it was a very high profile um, battle and John Finucane, who was the, the Lord Mayor of, of Belfast, um, took the seat for Sinn Féin from Nigel Dobbs, who was the DUP de deputy leader. So that was a very high, high profile tussle. Um, so the message was, was very clear. The percentage share was down for both the DUP and, and Sinn Féin. So again, there was a very clear message um, that they needed to get back into government. So, so that was where the momentum came from, if you like. They had to get back in and, and do, do a deal. Um, and there, there was a bit, bit of a window before Christmas talks then resumed after Christmas with, with not just an impetus, but a, a very fixed deadline um, that was set by the, the, the Secretary of State, the Northern Ireland Secretary of State, and also the, the Tanistia, um in, from, from the, the Irish government, the, um, the uh, deputy in the Irish government. Um, uh, so, so there was a very fixed deadline and there was the carrot and the stick, if you like. So there was the promise of, so Northern Ireland really needed money to sort out problems in the health service and other issues. There was the promise of a big cash injection from Westminster to do so if a deal was done. There was also the stick was, there was a very fixed deadline in the middle of January that if a deal wasn't done by this stage, there would be fresh assembly elections. Now fresh assembly elections, you know, publicly, um, all, all the parties would say, look, we are ready to stand and fight an election at any point. You know, privately, DUP and Sinn Féin certainly didn't want an election um, at this point, particularly with, the, 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 the newly strengthened um, or the, the, the increasingly strengthened Alliance Party as well, who you would have expected would have done very well um, in election under those circumstances. So really, I mean, it, it, was, it was in a sense about all, all those things, things coming together. There was certainly pressure put on by the British and Irish governments. There's this, the, the, the big prospect of the money. And there's also, well, if we don't do a deal now, you know, what, what, what's, what, what's, what's the alternative? And, and hanging over that, um, was also the prospect potentially of direct rule, so that that would that would be um, direct rule from from London rather than than the devolved devolved government uh, in, in Westminster. So really, it was a combination of all these things. And in in terms of the deal that was was eventually done, um, I mean, it's a it's a big document. Um, I, I got a copy of it that night. Um, you, you may have seen the the the, the, sort of the photos of, of sort of the Secretary of State and the Tanisha, um in the dark, you know, standing outside Stormont. I think it was. It was 58 pages, I think, um, off the top of my head. You know, and, and, and this was, in a sense, the roadmap to restoring power sharing. Um, you know, broadly speaking, you know, there, it, it, there were compromises. There, there were uh, measures in it for all sides. I mean, I mean, one of the, the big issues had been about an, an Irish language act and a standalone Irish language act. There wasn't that. Um, but there were measures put in place in regard to the Irish language and also the Ulster Scots language. That there would be a commissioner. Um, for each language. Um, there were also measures put, put in place uh, in regard to the petition of concern, which was one of the big um, issues that um, certainly that the Alliance Party had had. And the petition of concern was a mechanism which, uh, which had, been, had been misused um, to, to block legislation. So for example, the DEP would have used it to, to, to prevent a change in, in abortion laws. Um, and there were, the, the issues around that were, were, were that that fed into a wider point about the durability of the institutions. You know, there were, there were, the argument was that there's no point setting all this up again if it's just going to collapse again the next time another another crisis comes along. So, um, yeah, you know, a lot of compromise. It, it was something that all parties said that they, they could sign up to. Um, it was something that had something for everybody. Uh, and there was also this big cash injection. Uh, and it was on, on that basis then that, 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 the, that the institutions were, were re-established in, in, in mid-January. And um, just in case any of our listeners aren't aware, Alliance, and you might have said this, Alliance being the, the main cross-community party in, in Northern yeah. Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 
him. So it really interesting. So so the incentives there, the carrot and the stick in terms of the kind of shifting calculations of DUP and Sinn Féin, and then with the deal itself, um, a number of compromises and provisions to try and ensure that the institutions are more sustainable going forward. Yeah. Um, and Freya, um, that was, uh, we're now four months on from that point. Um, obviously, Northern Ireland is now in the midst of another crisis and dealing with COVID-19. Um, and we'll talk, turn to that in a minute. But uh, to the extent that it's possible that, or that it was possible to, to assess this before, uh, you know, before the, the pandemic, um, how was the, the agreement bedding in? Um, and or what were the signs? How, you know, how did relations appear between the, the power sharing parties up to that point? Yeah, I, I think it's it, 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 it's it's really difficult um, to, to, to be able to judge that one because they, they just had so little time, you know, and it, it, out of fairness to anybody, there, there was just so little time, um, you know, for anything really to become established or, 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 or for anything sort of to, to change. And, and we had, you said, I think at the start, we, the first case, first coronavirus case in Northern Ireland was confirmed um, towards the end of, of February. So you had roughly about a six week, week period. Um, and in the midst of that as well, in, in, in Northern Ireland sort of domestically, um, the, the, the um, politicians were also dealing with um, huge issues in, 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 the, in the health service. Um, so the, the, there was a widespread um, strike by, by nurses, by healthcare workers. I mean, nurses in Northern Ireland were on strike for the first time ever. Um, so to do, with, to do with, with pay, to do with, to do with waiting lists, all of this. So, so everything, even in that sort of period before coronavirus, you know, there, there, there was another crisis, if you like, um, that was needing dealt with d domestically. Um, and, and also, I suppose you have the, um, you know, we, we'd been without a government for, for three years, you know, it takes time for that kind of to, 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 to bed in. Um, I mean, I think I think what, what what we've seen certainly since is, I mean, th there will always be pressure points. You know, we know that there are always going to be pressure points. I mean, we 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 have um, the system in Northern Ireland is 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 unusual. I, I I don't know if it's unique, but I'm I'm sure there can't be many other you know systems anywhere else in the world. You know, but we we we've got a five party mandatory coalition. You know, what are the chances of ever get of ever getting? five parties to agree on on anything um so i mean for example what one of one of the the pressure points which we'd seen um at the end of last year and we saw again again this year is in regard to the extension of abortion legislation to northern ireland um same-sex marriage um which was legalized in northern ireland and i think i think i think it was on on valentine's day actually which was really yeah, i know the first yeah, the first, wedding. yeah the first wedding was on valentine's day yeah, yeah that's right yeah um, so, so, so something like that, for example, that, 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 that would have been, you know, that, that would have been, same as marriage, less controversial now than it would have been, but certainly um, the extension of abortion legislation, hugely, hugely um, controversial. Uh, and we, we saw towards the end of last year, actually, in, in fact, um, the, the, uh, the unionist parties trying to sort of bring Stormont back for a day to try and do something in this kind of last ditch, ditch attempt to stop this, you know, so, so there, there are always, there are always, differences of opinion, there are always going to be tensions. And, and I think one of the things, and I'm, I'm sure you'll come on to this, but one of the things we've seen since the outbreak of the coronavirus um, is, is that these tensions have been resurfacing in terms of, of, of what's the approach that we take in, in Northern Ireland. And, and essentially, I mean, to break it down into really um, sort of some simplistic um, terms, there, it, there, there's the, the, the split between following the, following the, 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 the London uh, approach, if you like, um, or following that of Dublin, uh, which is more aligned with the, the World Health Organization, you know, so, so you saw, so again, there were repeatedly these pressure points, there, there was an issue of, over the timing of when, when to close schools, um, there, there's been um, uh, discussions now in terms of how we get, we exit the lockdown, you know, how we do that on a kind of a, 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 an all-Ireland basis, um, memorandum of understanding was signed earlier this month, um, between North and South, which, which you know commits to to the good working relationships there, um, but there's still a lot of questions and a lot of lot of a lot of tensions around that. Yeah, yeah, really want to ask you more about that in a minute, Freya. Um, yeah, and but before uh, before I do, could you just give us um, a sense of the 
of the situation with regards to to COVID nineteen at the moment in Northern Ireland. Um, sure. You know, in a in a population of one point eight million as of today, um, I believe there there's uh, a recorded over three three thousand three hundred cases and sadly three hundred and nine deaths. Uh, they're the the latest figures that I have seen anyway. Um, so yeah, could you just kind of give us a a sense of the situation there and of the newly restored executive and assembly's handling of it to, up to this point? Sure, sure. So so yeah, so th those are I suppose the the headline figures. Um, I mean a couple of caveats on those. So for example, the 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 statistics on death that are released daily. Um, only include deaths in hospitals where there's been a positive test. Um, so if you take in things like deaths in, in care homes and, and things like that, it's estimated that, that it's about 30. So you could maybe say just over 400 um, fatalities out of a population of 1.8 million. Um, again, in terms of the number of tests, number of positive tests carried out, you know, there, there was an issue in regards to testing um, over a long period of time. So it took time to ramp up the number of tests. So tests weren't, weren't always always carried out um, in, in a sense. Um, and what we, we've seen now, um, I don't have today's figure off the top of my head, but for example, there was a day last week where there was over, over a thousand tests carried out in a single day. So we now see that um, kind, of, kind of coming on stream. Um, I mean, we're, we're in lockdown. We've been in lockdown since uh, middle, mid, mid to, mid, middle of March. I, I can't remember the date off the top of my head, which I really should be able to. Um, but again, in, in a way that sort of reflects yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it 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 sort of reflects um, the kind of the situation that, that that we've been in. In that, one of the things that we saw, particularly in border areas, was that so, for example, in the Republic, the decision was taken to close schools, um, or it was taken before St Patrick's Day, um, um, and then I think the decision to close restaurants and pubs and things was taken just before St Patrick's Day. So what you saw in the north was a lot of schools and a lot of similar businesses decided to close anyway because that's what they'd seen happening um and they felt that that that, that was the more responsible thing to do even though the 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 actual government instruction to do so which came from the uk government in westminster um came at, 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 at the end of that week so i think it would have been around about about the 20th of march so and i mean th that's one of the characteristics that we've seen in terms of how it's how, how it's how it's being dealt with and i sort of touched this on this previously I mean, in terms of cases the the majority of cases um and fatalities are in in and around belfast and the sort of greater belfast area um more rural areas seem to be less less badly hit um and there's also the 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 expert analysis of this is that the the virus seems to be proceeding in, in a very similar way on both sides of 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 the border and um, so the way it's operating in northern ireland is much more in common with the way it does on the rest of the island rather than in 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 the uk um so and that's to do with things like population density it's to do with um the fact that um the lockdown here was probably because because the virus is more advanced in, in, in Great Britain, you know, proportionally the lockdown here was probably introduced earlier. So that, that probably benefited um, as well. And, and now one of the areas where I suppose discussion is now starting to turn is how do we get out of the lockdown? You know, how, how does that work? You know, what does that look like? Um, and also then the cross-border collaboration um, in regard to that. And certainly one, one of the, and we had an editorial on this, um, I think about a week ago is about how that cross-border cooperation works because the point of view of, of the, the Republic um, you know it, it, it is the border with Northern Ireland the, the weak link you know not merely because the North may exit the lockdown at a different rate but also you have an open border there to the rest of the UK and possible you know infections coming so that there, there's kind of big questions around that I mean what what's been said um, the, the again the health minister here in, in the North Robin Swan has said look we will be led by the science applicable to Northern Ireland. You know, health is a devolved matter. So Northern Ireland could make its own decision, could diverge. The First Minister Arlene Foster said last week that, you know, that that, that we could do our own thing and could diverge from, from the rest of the UK. But all of those are the questions that are up in the air at the moment. That's what's being that's what's being discussed. And no no end in sight as yet, I should say, to to that lockdown. So yeah, Freya, you you talked about the the tensions that have emerged between the power sharing parties. Are you yeah, you alluded to that. 
over North-South cooperation. Um, obviously, yeah, Northern Ireland lies in quite a unique position, being part of one state, but sharing an island with another. Um, and that situation was obviously acknowledged in the Good Friday Agreement with its provisions for East-West cooperation, but also North-South cooperation. Um, and the, yeah, the pandemic, it seems, has really thrown that North-South cooperation into sharp relief. And, and again, the border seems has emerged, um, you know, as you know, a really significant political issue um, in Ireland's fight against the against the virus, as, as you've just talked about. Um, could you, yeah, tell us a little bit more, maybe about the about the tensions, uh, yeah, about I suppose, um, yeah, the, the tensions and challenges that have emerged, um, in you know, on the issue of North South cooperation b between the power sharing uh, parties, and you know, the extent to which the the border um, is emerging as a you know a significant political issue here. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I suppose in you know in, in some ways you know you might say that this is this is this is just the the natural outworkings, if you like, of you know the scenario we we have in 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 Northern Ireland. You know, so so you know broadly speaking, you know you know unions to. Yeah you know who are you know part of the uk who you know who, who want to remain part of the uk and then you know nationalists and republicans who who are irish and who you know would, would, would see there not you know would naturally look to dublin ra rather than, than london you know so in, in a sense what you get and when we talk about you know we talked about divisions in regard to brexit we talked about divisions in regard to other things you know that 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 that's that's in a sense this is nothing new you know the, the difficulty now is i suppose that we're dealing with something that nobody has envisaged um so what is essentially a political dispute um spills over into something that's about public health or something that's about um you know you know how, how do we how do we tackle this pandemic and i mean one thing you know when we're sort of talking about about differences i mean one thing i would say is that that every party every politician um you know all agree on one thing and that, that, that the priority is is absolutely to save lives um, you know that's that's very very clear where they disagree is is how best to do this and I suppose I mean you, you'll have seen the, the controversy uh, in regard to the UK's approach and the idea of, of herd immunity. Um, one of the things that, that that was abandoned very early on in Northern Ireland and in the rest of the UK was was, was contact tracing and, and, and sort of that, that aggressive testing that continued in the Republic and the, the approach in the Republic is much more aligned to the World Health, Health Organization. So you know the the, the 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 political differences are fundamentally are are about the differences in in approach as to how we tackle this and and, and this might be you know this could be in regards to testing or, or in, in regards to sort of ppe or where ppe is obtained from or sort of all, all these kind of other issues that, that that are feeding in um i mean in regard to i suppose the position on 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 the island professor gabriel scally um has been one of those who said one of the foremost public health experts has talked about you know squandering the opportunity that it, it, it is is on this island and what i would say that the the experts here have, have talked about uh, or sorry the health minister here has talked about you know following the approach in northern ireland what the chief medical officer and the chief scientific advisor here have said is 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 that the the virus is working and it, the pandemic is developing in a very similar way north and south and i think the framework is, is there so the memorandum of understanding that was that was signed emphasizes you know the need to work together you know at that at that scientific level um discussions are ongoing really every day between for example the chief medical officer here and the chief chief medical officer in in, in, in the republic um it's it's too early yet to, to know really the way that the way that i think either jurisdiction is going to come out of come out of the lockdown but you would imagine that logically speaking, it makes sense to do that in an, in an aligned way. And this is where we go back to again, the, the distinction between the political rather than the sort of health um, approach. Um, you know, it, it, it is more than possible, for example, that we might have, uh, we, we might have a, an approach which in practice really is quite similar or is quite aligned um, with, between both jurisdictions but it's not necessarily billed as an all-Ireland solution, which is going to make it much, much easier for, for unionists, for example, to, to accept. Mm, that's really interesting, that distinction between the, the political on the one hand and the, the practical or the, yeah, the... Oh, the the health-led, yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, what actually happens on the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 
Yeah, and how that, that framing is all important in Northern Ireland. Um, yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, and I suppose uh, there's a tendency in the way I framed that question was probably quite negative focusing on the on the challenges and the tensions. But of course, particularly on the practical level, as, as you set out for us there, there has been a great deal of, of unity and, and cooperation. Um, and that kind of leads me on to my next question, um, which we chatted a bit about this before we started um, when I was telling you that in my the class I teach at Villanova, uh, Irish Conflict and Peace, we've been talking a lot about these issues in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we had a, a debate yesterday in class about Irish reunification um, and the students were really interested in whether cooperate whether um north south cooperation on COVID-19 might lead to a deepening more broadly of north south cooperation and how that might feed into the debate about reunification that's obviously reignited you know in the wake of or uh, since since the Brexit vote um so yeah do you have any any thoughts on that Freya if it's yeah, I mean, one thing I would say just in regard to North-South cooperation more genu gen generally is that there's been kind of huge, huge degrees and huge level of North-South cooperation has been going on, um, you know, since, since since way before coronavirus, you know, was ever thought of, that it had ever happened, you know, and I mean, obviously, you know, the Good Friday Agreement in 1998 was kind of what, what enshrined that, but I mean, North-South cooperation goes back. Uh, I mean that that's the word we have for it for it now, you know. Um, but um, it, it go. I mean, it, you know, it, it informally, political, whatever, you know, it it goes back way way before Northern Ireland was even even um, it even existed, you know. Um, and and I, I think that the links, you know, we we can sometimes talk about the border um, as it's sort of this the, the, this line between. I mean, the reality is is that border is very permeable. I mean, you'll have heard your students will have heard. Um, during Brexit, much talk of I imagine an invisible border. I mean, that's the reality of it now. What what it's like, and and people have have family on both sides of the border. They work on one side, they live on the other. You know, you know, you know. So for for, for many people, that border just doesn't really exist. And there there are levels of north south cooperation formally and, in, and in, informally. You know, um, in in most aspects of life, I think in in in, in on the island of Ireland, and there, there have been sort of go, going way back. And and I mean, in 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 terms of of sort of where we are now and, and Irish unity, I think, again, you know, you, you have to look at the context of where we are and are now in, tw in 2020. So we've had for, for the last four, four years, really, since the Brexit referendum in, in, in 2016, I mean, the, the question of United Ireland has been really firmly put back on the agenda. And, and there, there have been a lot of a lot of the discussions in Northern Ireland have been centred around right okay what, what's that going to look like so one of the things that, that, that you've seen is the emergence of what's been sort of called civic nationalism so people who aren't politicians but people who are maybe nationalists but have other roles in sort of civic civic society or leadership roles other than the sort of overtly political ones and, and, and they've been coming together and, and yeah having that discussion right okay what, what do we want the united ireland to look like you know it that, that, you know if this is coming what sort of a state should it be you know and, and, and talking even about that language of, of of a united ireland you know um is that the best language are we talking about simply you know adding on six counties onto 26 or actually are we talking about creating a whole new new state a whole new country what might that look like might you have some sort of federal arrangement you know in your four provinces i mean you know so there are all of these kind of ideas on the table um which are really interesting what one one of the um what one of the um what one of the departments um now on on the table there was obviously a, a general election in the in the republic of ireland in february as well and, and, and the, the talks about a coalition have been sort of ongoing um but one of the things now is it is it, it is a department to look specifically at, at that question of, of of irish unity so the 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 discussion has got much broader and and that discussion is also bringing in um unionists people who who would not be who are not in favor of this but who are also saying um well look we think that this is going to happen um so how do we form it you know how do we, you know i i would point out that you know you talk to some unionists and they say this is complete nonsense this is this is this is never going to happen um i think they they, they would be outweighed um you know 
in in in, in society in Northern Ireland. I think in in general, in in terms of um, and I I think I think I think what has happened is that the United Ireland discussion has moved from something that was that, that was almost aspirational. So, so again, to sort of get back to the political, you know, Sinn Féin's raison d'etre is a United Ireland, and that's very clear and their message is very clear and, and it's always been the way but certainly in the years after the Good Friday Agreement and one of the things that it that it represented for nationalists was that you could be you could be a nationalist um, and that identity could be respected in Northern Ireland but you could also be part of Northern Ireland and you could make your future there and your children can make their future there um, and Brexit to an extent turned some of that on, on its head and, and other other sort of issues as well um, but people then began now to look at this question of again of, of, of that Irish unity what 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 does it look like and it moved from being this sort of aspiration to actually well it feels very imminent and Sinn Féin uh, Mary Lou Macdonald said um at the Sinn Féin Ardèche last year five years so that was 2019 so 2024 you know I don't know if it'll happen by 2024 but certainly um you know there is a momentum there now in terms of how quickly this may happen. May happen. Uh, I mean, I should point out there have been timetables on this before, and, and they and they haven't happened. You know, nothing nothing is predetermined, um, but certainly Brexit really gave that to be a, a new impetus. I mean, in terms of where the current situation regarding coronavirus comes into this, I mean, Mary Lou again w w was was criticised um, by, by by unionists for for saying recently that coronavirus again made the case for Irish unity. Um, I think if you speak to nationalists on the ground, they will say that this absolutely underlines the cause for United Ireland because, you know, it, it, it's practical, you know, you know it, it's common sense. We're one small island. We should be dealing with this, with this in, in, in the same way. I mean, I think it's too early really to tell how this will all play out because I think, you know, we're in the middle of something we've never seen before. We're in the middle of a crisis that we've never seen before. We don't know how to deal with this or we, we, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know how this will develop, um, so I think it's too early to say what that effect might ultimately be. But but I think it certainly builds on um, builds on what we've seen previously and and, and, and previous trends, and even you know de de demographic trends. Um, you know, all seem to be going seem to be going in, in that direction. Yeah, I believe the majority of school children in Northern Ireland at the moment are are Catholic. Um, well, um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're right. I don't know the, the figures off the top of my head, but I, I, I know the um, c certainly the 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 um, no, is it not four year olds or not five five year olds um, are more are more Catholic than than yeah. they would be Protestant, yeah. and and that's not to, that's not to say that those two equate. No, um, no, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a sort of a broad, it's it's a sort of a broad gauge, but yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, bro bro broadly speaking, you know, Catholics are more are, are more likely to be nationalists than they, than they would be, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, in in terms of the demographics, yeah, it it also seems to be moving moving that way. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, uh, really interesting, um, just well all of what you said there but yeah I'm particularly interested in the civic element of the of the debate and the the issue around unionist inclusion in any potential you know uh, unified Ireland um, and how that how unionists might be accommodated you know within that within the political structures like you referred to a potential federal or, or devolved option uh option there yeah that was something actually that came up in our in our class yesterday because you know as some of the students even were, uh, some of the students were saying you know the good friday agreement inclusion was obviously central to that and you know in any in any shift towards a, a united ireland inclusion would have to be you know would have to be at the core as well um, yeah, yeah, and, and and I think I mean there, there, there's a school of thought that says that actually unionists as a group would be the people who would benefit best out of this scenario because um, so much would be put in place to to ensure that that didn't happen. And and I mean privately again, I've spoken to people who who, who would be not not politicians, but who would be 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 broadly speaking nationalists who who would say things like 
well, look, you know, I, I've got no interest in becoming part of a state that discriminates against somebody else. You know, there was discrimination against Catholics in, in Northern Ireland, you know, but I don't want then part of a state where something like that would happen. And, and, and there, you know, there's no suggestion that that, that would. Um, but it, it, it's something clear that people are, are, you know, people are thinking about. And, and, and it's about, it's again about that changing of language, you know, that rather than a united Ireland, which is maybe the, you know, the traditional aspiration, you know, that, that, that that's really firmly associated with, with, with Sinn Féin it's about thinking okay let, let's 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 all create something new here um you know how possible that would be I don't know I mean again we're at the very early days of this and one of the things that has happened because of coronavirus is obviously that a lot of this activity has stopped um, but I suppose the phrase I keep keep or kept using in the last few years is about you know th this this United Ireland question being back on the table and, and I think what Certainly, what what Brexit has done, I think, what what having no government for three years, and and, and I mean there was apathy among the population for for a lot of that time, uh, and people looking in from outside would say this is crazy. How can you not have a government? And and people don't really care that much, um, you know, all, all of that. Even the Scottish independence referendum before then, um, you know, everything to do with the lack of government, why that happened, uh, you know, and even where we're at, you know, all of that has has fed into this kind of change in conversation. And we're at the stage now, you know, we're approaching a hundred years since Northern Ireland was was created, and and there are these, you know, these questions about, you know, its continued status, about will it continue, to, what what will it look like, you know, what might it might a new Ireland look like, you know, these are these really big constitutional questions that are on the table, um, and. At, I mean, personally, I think it's a really interesting time to be to be a journalist here because you're dealing, you know, you can't get questions bigger or more fundamental than that, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. And um, I would love to ask you more about that, Freya, and about other issues. But I think that is all we have time for, unfortunately, and it's a good note to end it on. Um, so thank you so much for you. Uh, for thank sharing you. your your insights with us and for taking the time to speak to us today. Um, and can I also take the opportunity just to thank you more broadly for for the work you're you're doing at the moment as a journalist. Thank as you. we've talked about, it's clearly not easy at the moment, but you know many of us really really appreciate and, and really rely on uh, on the work you're doing and on the the reporting that you produce. So uh, thank you and. Uh, take care and uh, mind yourself uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah i hope to hope we can uh, speak to you again soon perhaps next time about your book yeah i'd love to yeah <laughs> yeah okay thank you so much and um, so that is it for this episode thank you for listening uh, and please do stay connected with the center for Irish studies news and events through our website and also our online newsletter uh, through face our facebook and instagram and twitter and um, meantime take care mind yourselves and i hope to see you soon <laughs>